Okay, it is 11 o'clock. Thank you for joining us for Virtual Conservation Live. Um, if you are new to Virtual Conservation Live, welcome. This is a program that was designed for fourth graders to replace the conservation field day that we at the Tippecanoe County Partnership for Water Quality um, host every spring. Um, I am Ben Wegleitner. I'm a stormwater educator for the partnership, and I think you all know Monica. Monica's on mute. She's unmuted, okay, there she goes. Still muted. Yeah. Okay. There it goes. Hello, everybody. So I just <laughs> wanted to put this out there. I saw a question earlier um, that there are several different schools here. So when you see a name, you probably or may not know everybody on here, but there are several different schools um, attending this. So that's really cool, even though you can't see everybody, but yeah, lots of people. Yes. And that's a great reminder. Please only use the Q&A box for asking questions for our presenter or answering question, those questions that our presenter asks. Um, the Q&A box is not for chatting with your friends or letting everyone know you're on. Um, if your teacher asks you to say hi just to know that you're on, um, you can do that. But please do not try to communicate with each other. Um, we will get rid of those comments immediately. So. Um, without further ado, we have uh, an extra special guest today, uh, Jim McKenna. He is an operational tree breeder for the HTIRC, the Hardwood Tree Improvement Research Center. Is that right, Jim? Yes, that's right. All right, then I will let you do it from there. All right, well, welcome, everybody. It's certainly a shame that you guys aren't out here today at our Martell Forest, which we're about eight miles um, west of, of, of town. Uh, it's a beautiful place, as Monica and Ben know. And those, well, any of the kids, the older kids that might have been out here could tell you. Last year it was a terrible rainy day, and Monica got us into the armory in Lafayette, which was a pretty great thing to do uh, at the last minute. But today is a gorgeous day. It's sunny and clear and, and cool and not too hot and not too cold. So. Well, all right. Well, so today I'm going to give you uh, uh, one of the one of the demonstrations I've done many times for this program and others is grafting, grafting trees. Uh, I wonder if any of you uh, does anybody know grafting? Has anybody heard of grafting trees? What grafting trees is like? One thing uh, you might see if you went to an apple orchard, maybe a you pick apple orchard. If you look down at the base of the tree, you might see something funny. This was the base of a tree so many years ago that we cut out. And this is actually a black walnut rootstock that had a butternut grafted on top of it. Butternut is white walnut, black walnut is black walnut. They're two different species. Uh, the, the Latin names, the scientific names, Juglans cinerea for the butternut and Juglans nigra for our black walnut. Now, black walnut's very common. I'm sure you guys know that one. I've got a few nut samples here. We're in our laboratory out at Martell. You can see the black walnut. You, I'm sure you guys have seen this nut before. Do we get anybody responding that knows grafting? We have not. Nobody yet. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. you're all going to understand grafting at the end of this, this, this session. Now, here is the butternut. Now, has anybody ever seen a nut like that? Turn that one around a little bit. A couple of yeses. A couple of yeses. Excellent. Excellent. Um, make sure you're preparing your resume too for Purdue and you know early enrollment. We do recruit <laughs> students, not just athletes. So okay, good. Well, and so the thing is, is that butternut is suffering from a from a, 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 a disease that came in oh about 60 years ago to the country and has basically destroyed 95% of the trees. So they're dying. Yep, they're dying out, and we're trying to find the rare surviving trees that we hope have resistance. And we put them into a collection to let them interpollinate so that we can ultimately grow up seedlings, okay? Right now, we can't get very many seeds from butternuts. What it looks like, I've got a little tray of walnuts for a colleague of mine that we're growing for her work, her research here. So you can see these are black walnut seedlings that we're growing in the greenhouse right now. They started germinating a few weeks ago. You can see the, the big one there with the floppy leaves that came up. And then you can see some of the younger ones just starting to pop up. The problem is though, for the butternut tree, it's not making seeds. 
the trees are struggling to survive and they need other trees to cross pollinate to make seeds. So all we can find out in the woods are, are, are the, the single tree and we can go out and collect sticks. And so that's what we do. We go out in the winter time, typically January, February, and we'll collect sticks and we'll put them up in a bag just like this and put it in the refrigerator to keep them moist and cool. And this is a bag I just pulled out of the refrigerator. Okay, and this is what it looks like. This happens to be a tree that actually came from North Carolina, a few hundred miles south of us here. And you can see what the wood looks like. Now, yeah. we make sure and tag everything. We've got to record and keep track of all the different trees we have. We've got over 500 in our collection on Butternut right now. And so these are the, these are the shoots that we get down from the tree that we can now, if we can graft these onto a black walnut seedling, we can get this tree to grow. And it's very much easier than getting the seeds. Hey, can any of you think about why is it a problem maybe to get these, these butternut seeds too if they were forming in the forest? Does anybody know why you might have a real hard time finding seeds in the forest of a rare tree like this? Does anyone know? Anybody know? Can you give them a hint? Yeah. Well, I'll show you another one too that people graft Persian walnut. This is the walnut that people like to eat. I'm sure a lot of you have seen these. You see these in the store in the fall. Okay. People like to eat these. Hey, Jim, the is, it because, it's a problem is that? it because birds eat them or because they're very small? Ah, Ben, close, close, close. The bird will come in after the squirrel. <laughs> the squirrel. Here's another one of our, uh, this is actually a hybrid butternut, yeah, and you can see what the squirrels do. You should be able to see a lot of that out in the woods. You'll see black walnut shells that are, that are chewed open. The squirrels, they love to do that. That actually uh, is good for their teeth. It's kind of like the way they brush their teeth. And, but yeah, we have a problem. You can't, you can't grow this because there's nothing there anymore. In fact, I have a little, <laughs> I took this, I found this butternut in the lab this morning. And I put a rubber band around it because I can show you too. You might not know. So here inside what they look like. This is a butternut. Now the baby tree, the baby tree, if I can get this in the camera, right, is right there. If I can hold that steady. Can you see that? Yeah, the little shoot yeah. is coming in clear. See on this side now, there is no baby tree. So all of this tissue is the food that the squirrels eat and people eat too. In fact, these Persian walnuts, these come out of California. They're the ones you see in the store. My daughter actually bought me some of these and got me this nutcracker for Christmas. And the reason people like those, they're so easy to crack. Wow. There we go. <laughs> yeah, crack and open up. All right. I don't think I've stored those well, though. I'm not going to eat that one now. All right, so back to the grafting then. So we've got our dormant sticks, right? We've got our bag of wood. Then what we need to do is get some seedling rootstocks. Uh, the little baby ones I showed you, those are too small. Let me find one here. Here's the rootstock. So we usually work with our, with our forestry nursery in Southern Indiana, and we pot these up. I gotta pick that up. You can see that these are potted up, pretty good sized pot. We'd like to get trees like this. This is what we're gonna do. We can go ahead and take the butternut cyan wood. That's what we call it, cyan wood the tree we're trying to graft and, and propagate, make more of, and we'll put it right here on the stem. All right, so let me see, maybe I need to lower my camera a little bit, how's that? Much better. Is that better? Okay, because what we've got to do, so we're gonna basically change the top of this tree. So we just cut that out, you see that? Toss that to the side, and that leaf, yeah. Let's see, let me let me maybe get you a little closer here. Okay. See, see that? Is that coming in pretty clear? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, good. We always shoot for perfect, but we will accept pretty good. So okay, so then what you want to do is you want to match the diameter of the stem. And this looks to me like it's a pretty good match. So I'm going to use this piece of wood to graft. What we have to have too, we have to have good, healthy. I'm going to prune a leaf over here that's attacking me. We have to have good buds. See, the branch has these buds that if anything goes wrong, like say ice damage or something, wind damage, storm damage, 
the trees will all have dormant buds down their stems, and then that bud will grow the new shoot. Okay, so to graph this, then I'm going to make a fresh cut on the base of the side of the of the stick, right there. I've got a very good bud right here and right here. Okay, this bud down here. Well, I may lose that bud as I make the cut. Because what I've got to do is I've got to I've got to connect this so that the two branch the two branches will grow together. Let's turn this one around. There we go. All right. So I always like to start out cutting the cyan stick. This is cold out of the refrigerator and dormant. And what I want to do is I want to make a nice flat cut on, on this stick. And I'm going to make a, a similar cut on the rootstock. And then I'll show you how I connect it with a little notch. All right. Let me see. Can you see that? Yeah. How about that? There we go. Now you see that? And the way the trees grow, for those of you that don't know, maybe you guys already know this, fourth graders, fifth graders might know it. The outer tissue is the bark, obviously, right? And then that white tissue inside is the, um, the wood. Well, right in between, let me show you on the, on the cut surface of the graph. Right in between, there's a, there's a very fine line, that's called the cambium, and that's the tissue that actually makes new cells. It makes bark cells outside, wood cells inside, and that's what you have to connect to your rootstock to get the graft to grow and take. So the tree, the, the tree can take up water and the graft will grow. So all right, so now I see this. I think I'm gonna cut my rootstock down a little bit more. Maybe get you in a little better light. We often too will hold these in our mouth. You know? And let's see. That is a little bit too short. I, well, you know what? I think I'm gonna shorten this stick. What I wanna do is I wanna have the length of this cut match between the cyan stick and the rootstock. I like that cut. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut this one again. Let me cut that a little shorter. So remind us again why we're doing this, because we can't find enough nuts out in the forest to regrow these trees. Exactly, these trees are so rare and they need others to pollinate to make nuts. We don't have that. So they're not making nuts. And, did you and say then the few grow? that do, you know, where there are a few in the woods, the squirrels usually beat us to them. We can't yeah. keep up with the squirrels. The and squirrels don't have to go to school. They don't do chores or homework. They're always out there looking for nuts. That's all the squirrel does. Lazy squirrels. Um, well, no, they're not lazy now. Why? They're very good at yeah. nuts. Can you? That's for another module. You can graft a butternut to something else, right? So you're grafting a butternut onto, is this a walnut? Yes. Okay, so you can use two different types of trees to graft. Yes, you can, you can. Now we graft walnuts as well. We've got some other reasons why we want individual trees propagated and make more of those to test them for research um, and, and seed production too with our state seed orchard partners. However, um, those will typically graft onto black walnut, yeah. Uh, the, the reason this works is that they're in the same genus. So the plants are grouped, plants and animals both. Animals, you can't really graft though. Now, it is a lot more tricky with the animals. I don't even wanna to touch that right now. Let's keep, let's stay away from that. But for the plants, it's very, most plants can be grafted within the same genre, the same genus, yep. So they have to be closely related. Like you can't graft an apple onto a walnut. That won't work. Nope. But uh, there's, you use different rootstocks when there's an advantage for it. In our case, we can get a lot of black walnut. The butternut is the rare one. So we have to use this method to propagate it. Okay, so now that I've got the cuts, you can, can you see how those are equal length? Does that look pretty equal to you there? Now the trick is, since I want to match that, that cambium line, okay, how am I gonna, how am I gonna put this together? Right? Now, if I had my assistant, maybe he could hold that, because I'm gonna have to tie this together. It's gonna take about a week or 10 days for it to heal. Well, it's kind of hard and, oh, if it falls off, that's not gonna work. So there's a little trick that's been developed where we put in a little notch. We call this whip and tongue grafting. So this is the whip, which is a, well, just a long vegetative shoot. There's the whip and we, we, we cut it to join, but now how are we gonna join it? Well, it turns out if we put a little notch halfway down this cut, you can see I'm about halfway down that cut surface. I'm gonna work my knife, rock that down safely. All right, pull that out. Now I gotta do the same thing on the science stick. 
Let me get there halfway down. All right. But I like to flare it out a little bit. Now, when I turn it around, I can put it there with a notch just above on the science stick. And I can turn my knife around and use it as a hammer. Hey, look at that. See, it's not falling off. Now I want to make sure how well did I match this? Okay. Turns out, well, ah! I got to do it again. Okay. Let me get it back. Looks like my rootstock is a little wider than the sign, which is fine. So what I want to do, like I say, we shoot for perfect, but we'll take pretty good. You don't have to match everything. Ah! <laughs> Funny when the trap is that. Sometimes I make noises when I do this. Yeah. You've got to clean that off, though. You've got to keep uh, you got to keep it out of the dirt in that. All right, let me. Why do you got to keep it out of the dirt? Tell us why you need to keep it out of the dirt. Well, because you can get you can get different plant pathogens, plant diseases live in the dirt. So we want to keep this sterile. This is tree surgery. This is actually tree surgery. There we go. Now we have it good. Yep. Locked in on, on both sides all the way around. I'm going to put it down a little bit more. And typically we'll cut, we'll cut right there below the cut surface. Okay, because the cambium tissue that's going to connect the scion and the rootstock. That's also when you see a, a tree where a branch was pruned, you see that kind of donut of callus tissue. That's the cambium tissue that's making that donut of callus and, and healing up the, the cut branch. Now on the back side, I take a look. <clears throat> yep, and there's a little bit of flap of the rootstock here. So I'm gonna trim that back. Okay. Does it always have to be a seedling that you graft? No, if, if we had a rooted cutting, for example, of walnut, and, and there have been some rooted cuttings, Developed, we could use a clonal rootstock that we would root the sticks that we've actually put uh, put roots right on the stick. Yeah, so if we had that, we could. Yeah, that's a good question. It doesn't have to be a seedling. It still has to be uh, related, though. All right, so this is now connected well. I've got pretty good. I got about 85% cambium match. It looks like. Now I'm going to take some grafting tape. We call it tying tape, plastic tape, and I'm going to I'm going to put that around. Yep, and snug that down. The plastic is going to keep it moist, and it's also going to hold it together nice and firmly so that it doesn't fall off. You saw me drop it there to begin with. That's not a good technique. There we go. What's the success rate of that? Well, you know, it varies a lot. I mean, sometimes we get in the high 90%. Sometimes we, you know, things go wrong. Usually it's more things going wrong in the greenhouse or a freezing event or, you know, uncontrollable weather can, can come in and, and knock your percentage down to zero. I've had some fail actually some years. There we go, cut that, cut that down. Yeah. Then what we'll do, and I figured I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna necessarily do it. It's gonna be hard for you to see. We have a grafting wax that we'll further cover that up with. Well, wait a minute, my wax is in pretty good shape. Yeah. You got about nine minutes. Nine minutes, good. Nine minutes. Nine minutes. So what we like to do is, is put the grafting wax. The most important thing is to kind of seal up that top edge so that when we water these and when we put them outside and the rain comes, that'll I've just kind of sealed up that top edge of the tape and then we'll cover the whole surface of the tape. Yep. And then we always too like to put a little dab of wax on the top cut surface because that again will seal that up. See that. You see that pretty good. And will that stay on the tree forever? Well, no. As the tree as the tree grows in diameter, you know, over time, you won't see this at all. No, you won't see this at all. Um, the last thing we'll do. There's one more step. We'll actually we'll change from black to white. We'll get um, interior white paint. This is just water soluble white paint. And we'll actually whitewash the stick now. We'll cover up those buds. Yeah. And does anybody know why we might want to do that? Put white on the stick? I'll show you one that we did a couple weeks ago. 
it's just starting to take here. But I don't want to pull out the paint. I might get paint all over the laboratory and Good our janitor point. will get mad at me. We usually do this in the greenhouse where we can make a mess. See, but you can see the white. Now, can anybody think, does anybody know what, why might we do that? Why do we want white latex paint to cover the surface? You know that we've wrapped, you can see, you can see the wrapped plastic, I think, there. Keep the wax from wearing off. Well, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. but we actually, in the walnuts and the butternuts, we, we, we like the, the heat that we get from the black. Black surfaces will absorb more heat, right? If you touch something black or you wear a black t-shirt in the summer on a hot day, right? You're, oh, I want to wear a white shirt. The white reflects light and gets cooler. The black absorbs light and can get warmer. So we can exploit that. We want to keep the buds on the, on the cyan stick cool and dormant. We want to keep them, kind of let them hold back. We don't want them to grow until the graft union itself has connected because otherwise the buds will come out and they won't be able to get water from the roots. And you can see this one, if I can hold this steady, this one we grafted about two weeks ago and it's one of our early takes. Let's see, can you see that bud oh. right here? Mm -hmm. Go ahead and point to it. Can you see that? Wow. Yep, and that is gonna be the new stem on the tree. So this is a butternut grafted on, on black walnut. This is going to be a success. A very nice one. I'll show you one. We uh, usually start with black cherry. We did black cherry, butternut, and chestnuts this year. Now here's a cherry that we did first. We did this one about six weeks ago. And so you can see there, there's the knot where I we tied the tape. In this, it, for cherry, cherry likes it cooler. That's why we do it earlier in the year. And then we actually put the whitewash, the white paint, over the black wax. But you can see this is one of the buds that we've now got the new stem. And this is shaping up to be a very nice tree. Right? So how soon will you plant those? We'll plant these in, in July, early July, yeah. Or we'll grow them all year and then keep them in our cooler and plant them in the spring depending, right? Obviously everything's different these days under our pandemic, right? So yeah, we're kind of having to adapt a little bit on the fly. Yeah, like doing yeah. a virtual field day instead of a real field day. Tell us, tell us how the coronavirus has changed the way that you work and how you do your job. Oh, well, it's changed quite a bit. I mean, uh, we're now, for example, we don't drive, none of us here at Purdue and in the Forest Service and the government, we are not driving together. Many of us, if we don't have critical field work, we're doing all of our uh, office work now at home. Everybody's set up home offices. Yeah, for me, I, I, I have critical and essential work. Well, trees like this that we grafted last year had to get planted out this year, and seedlings we grew last year, they were destined to get planted out, and so we had all those sites prepared. We, in fact, we just planted a chestnut orchard yesterday. But what we're doing is, so um, my assistant, he's driving uh, our truck, and then I'm driving my car. No, we're not driving together. You know, we're staying, you know, six feet. Everybody's supposed to stay six feet apart. Well, we're trying to stay eight feet minimum, and we can do that, but it, you know, it's challenging. For grafting this year, we set up two different independent grafting stations, because as you saw too, when I, when I make these cuts, right, I cut these, these shoots as I'm, as I'm working on the, uh, as I'm going to cut the, the rootstock next, I'll put those in my mouth. Well, the coronavirus is a respiratory pathogen. It, it, that's how you move it from your saliva and, and your snot. So talking, you've got little drops of saliva that go out. Obviously, when you put the stick in your mouth, I've just contaminated this if I had the virus, right? So, and then when we can't uh, distance ourselves, we're wearing masks and gloves. We've got our 70% alcohol spray that we spray surfaces down. Our janitor, Glenn here, is doing a great job disinfecting everything out here too for the few of us that are working in Martell now. So yeah, it's, it's really impacted us a lot. So here's a few questions. One, does that contaminate the tree um, by you putting that in your mouth? Ah, good question. You know what? No, not at all. Uh, when you look at biology, there's basically two huge divisions. You've got the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom. And there's never been a case of a disease of plants going to animals, right? And okay. people are animals. No, so there's no, that, that just doesn't happen, never has happened. 
Next question sure. is, um, will the tree still make cherries or produce something else? Will it still produce? Yes, and that's a very good question too. In fact, one of the reasons that people in apple orchards, for example, will graft the seedlings, okay, seedlings will take a long time, just, just like you guys are all too young to make children, right? You're, none of you are having children. It takes so long. Same thing with trees. It can take some of the trees 20 years before they make seeds, but when we graft them, and I just happen to have our chestnut. Yeah, this is a chestnut we grafted about a month ago. It's doing quite well. You can see everything I showed you there. And then let me show you. So chestnuts will take anywhere from seven to 10 years to make seeds. Let's see if I can, it's a little hard to see, I suppose. Can you see this though? Doesn't that look different? That's not a leaf, is it? That's actually a flower stalk. Wow. Yeah, and so when we graft an older tree, a tree that's already making seeds, it'll continue to make seeds. So it's grafting is a, is a method of producing seeds more predictably. Yeah, and quicker. Great so question. how many trees do you graft a day and how long does a grafted tree live? Well, the grafted tree can live for a long time. I mean, the, the grafting doesn't really affect the tree. In fact, I've got, I've got another example. If you remember, I showed you one earlier. Here is a, a butternut that we grafted years ago here at Martell. Yep, on a black walnut. Yeah, and you can see that's the graft line now. The tree, the, this, this line will always be at the same place. It's never gonna change. Um, the trees, as the trees get thicker and larger in diameter, they do that from, that from that cambium tissue that continues to make bark outside and wood inside. You can see the black walnut wood, maybe here on the bottom, the darker color. Butternut has a lighter colored wood. You can see that. And if you can count the rings, I'm counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, actually, seven. So this, this tree we grafted was in the field for seven years. And even though it had that slope cut too, where's one of my sticks? Uh oh, I'm getting lost here on my table. So remember, this is how exactly how we started this tree seven years ago. Now, who can explain? It doesn't look like a slope anymore. What's going on? What happened there? How did that happen? How, how does it look like a straight line now? And it'll look like this forever. I've seen grafted walnut trees with the, uh, back with a Persian walnut again. Yep, in California, I've seen them 100 years old. But why is it that it becomes a straight line? And it, that happens for every tree, every species. Can anybody answer that one? Um, go ahead and go for it, just because we're a little short on time. Sure. Well, what happens is as that cambium continues to grow, and you know that the trees grow in rings, right? So that very, if down at the graft union, you would see, if we, if we cut through this, you would see, you would see that, um, you would see that slope cut. Mm -hmm. But over time, it just gets buried in the middle of the tree as mm. the tree continues to grow outward with the rings. Yep, and then it gets that smooth line. So here's a question for you, Jim. How did you know you wanted to work with nuts and trees? Yeah, I, I sure didn't, and <laughs> I didn't at all. In fact, I started out in college in psychology. I was born in Detroit, Michigan. Yep, and I went to three colleges when I was young, out of high school in Michigan, and I was studying psychology. And uh, I have to say that I was kind of not so smart uh, about it. I actually was the first person in my family to go to college. My parents wanted me to be a plumber and electrician. They thought that would be a better job than a psychologist. And uh, they, they may have been right. I got to the end of it and I figured, I realized, wow, the jobs I could do with a psychology degree, I didn't like. And I, I liked studying the subject, but it uh, wasn't something that I wanted to do, a, you know, and make a living with. So I, I quit college for a few years and then I ended up in California and it just hit me one morning that I really liked agriculture. I had never, I uh, had no farming background or that, but I just thought, wow, you could study agriculture in college. I'd like to do that. So I got into agriculture, and while I was into that, um, I just so happened to meet a professor who showed me uh, some of these different kind of propagation things they were doing, and I just found, kind of fell in love with trees. I, I found that I really liked trees better than crops like corn and beans. 
I still like corn and beans, don't get me wrong, but I really do love trees. So yeah, that's kind of how I, st I stumbled into it. So if I wanted to try this at home with my parents, how would I start? Yeah, there's a lot of good online guides. So, you know, you can just Google how to graft, you know, do a Google search, how to graft trees. And um, the thing is, though, is right now we're getting to the end of the season. Some, well, some of them we're doing, but the one trick with it, you got to plan a little bit because you had to collect your graft wood in the winter and keep it dormant. Yeah. So in, unless you can get some graft wood, now there's different groups, too. In fact, I, I work with uh, people in the Indiana Nut and Fruit Growers Association. And you, if you contact them, they do have cyan wood. Some members will, will share that with you and, you know, could mail you some. And then, yeah, you can, you don't have to get to the, these grafting knives. You need a very sharp knife, but you could also do this with, with razor blades. So your parents probably have a, a good razor blade that they could use as well. Yeah. It's, it's not that hard to do. It takes a little practice, but uh, most people can, you know, can get quite a few to take. And some species are very easy. Apples and peaches are very easy. So they want to know you actually get paid to graft trees? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. That's really cool. <laughs> well, somebody said, too, how many do we do a day? <laughs> Typically, when we're working well here, uh, we can do 200 a day. Oftentimes, it'll be more like 100. But when you get into the commercial nurseries that do this for orchards and that, they'll graft anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 a day. So there's, there's ways to speed up the method. Yeah. Wow. Can you only graft trees or can you do other plants? Do other like non-woody plants work for grafting? Yeah, that's a great question. You can, you can graft other plants. Like for example, let's say that you had, you went to your friend's house and they're farmers and you're a farmer. Hey, your folks are growing corn, regular field corn, right? It's going to be yellow. You know what that looks like. Hey, but then you go to a friend and they've got some of the orange or purple varieties, the old uh, Native American varieties that have purple, orange, or, or um, red kernels. And you said, wow, I really like that. Hey, you could actually graft, you know, a purple, red corn plant before it flowers. You could graft that onto your, your field corn. And yeah, and you would end up getting the purple red corn, whatever that variety was, you could. People are doing it now with tomatoes too. It turns out there's some wild species of tomatoes that are very resistant to soil-borne diseases. So instead of using really toxic chemicals to kill those soil-borne diseases that are expensive and they pollute, people have found, hey, if we can graft tomatoes, we could put them on a wild rootstock and then still get the tomatoes that are tasty that we like to eat, yeah. So grafting has got a lot of, it offers a lot of advantages. It's, it's a very kind of creative way to propagate plants. Okay, we're gonna go with the last question that we have, which is a question that we're asking all of our experts that have joined us for Virtual Conservation Live. What is one thing that you wish everyone in the world knew about grafting trees or rare tree species or whatever you wanna talk about? What is ah. one thing you wish everyone in the world knew about that? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, um, you know, what's, what's, what's ironic with that question. Let me go back. My chestnut, our chestnut, I work with the American Chestnut Foundation. It's a national group and uh, we have a state chapter here in Indiana too. This was a tree that there were 5 billion trees in the country. And 120 years ago, a disease came in from Asia and uh, it came into the Bronx Zoo in New York City, and it began to kill those trees, and it radiated out. We had these growing in the Indiana forest in southern Indiana, where we had millions and millions, and these trees got to be huge. They were called even, the American chestnut was said to be the uh, sequoia, or the redwood of the east, like those giant redwood trees, sequoia trees in California. The trees got so huge, 12 feet in diameter, 140 feet tall. The wood was fantastic. The seeds are very healthy. Oh, in fact, I even have a couple. Now, one minute. I found some chestnuts growing in the, this is, a, this is what this, this flower on the chestnut will produce. That's an American chestnut seed, G germinating, there's the root. These seeds, this tree made so much, um, so many seeds, we still don't understand how it affected the wildlife when it disappeared so quickly. So it, it became, it was a pandemic. And um, 
The interesting thing is, is that, uh, what's that? 30 seconds. 30 seconds, I got it. Um, Emerald ash borer, you probably are all familiar with the dying ash trees around town and it's all around the country. Well, this has been happening over the decades and over the centuries too, as people move things around and these diseases come out. So um, trying to support us and, and understand that, you know, everybody can play a part to help try to mitigate this. Awesome. Okay, I have one more thing. Um, just got a comment in here from one of the teachers that said, this is such an interesting session. Thank you for all the information. Oh, you, Thank you, you very are very much. welcome, teachers. Oh, my goodness, yes. Help. Please give Jim a little quiet round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank Jim, you, Jim. A reminder right, well, thank everyone. you all. A reminder to everyone, we have another session coming up at 1 o'clock today. We'll be learning about what fish can do for water quality, what fish tell us about water quality. If you don't have the Zoom link already, please write it down. Our guest speaker will be Megan Gunn from Purdue University, um, and she has some fantastic information about uh, water quality. Yeah, once again, Megan is excellent. She's an excellent yes. researcher. Yes, so once again, Enjoy. thank you very much, Jim. Thank you everyone sure. for joining us, and hopefully we will see you at 1 p.m. today. Bye. Bye, you guys. Bye, Jim. Bye.